Hello everybody and thank you for joining us today. This is part four of the 12 part webinar series on the 90 day business sprints and it's hosted by Chris Snyder, the CEO and president of the Exit Planning Institute as well as the awarded thought leader of the year. Uh, just a few notes before I turn it over to Chris today. Uh, my name is Drew English. I am the program coordinator here at the Exit Planning Institute. Um, I am recording this webinar and I will send it out to everyone afterwards. So just look for an email from me later this afternoon. And then if you have any questions, uh, you could feel free to contact me or uh, Chris directly. We'd be more happy to help you out. But with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Chris and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get going today. Chris? Thanks, Drew. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to webinar number four on the 11 actions to rapidly grow value and uh, uh, harvest wealth. Uh, before we uh, jump into the material for today, as we normally do, I uh, wanted to just double check to make sure everyone did their homework from last month, or at least has started that. Uh, last month we covered the uh, personal planning aspect and uh, your objective or your homework uh, action item was to commit to developing a written personal plan in the next 90 days. So I hope you've at least started on that and uh, as always if there's anything that I can do to help uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, today um, we're going to talk about uh, making business value your number one goal. And this is uh, something near to dear in my heart and it's really the basis for uh, my book, Walking to Destiny and the way that we handle uh, exit planning and growth. Um, value should be your number one goal. And I know that as owners, you're told a lot of different things. Uh, your, your, you know, there are suggestions that people should be your number one goal, that growing sales and income should be your number one goal. I really think that you need to step back and take a look at uh, making value your number one goal. And the reason is that value um, drives all other positive outcomes. So if you're focused on value, um, you're going to have to execute very well. Execution. Uh, which we'll cover in a later webinar, is a key aspect of driving value uh, into a business. Um, if you're focused on value, uh, you're going to be focused on your intangible assets, which includes people. Uh, it also includes customer relationships, uh, building your culture, and developing uh, structure. So those things are driven by a focus on value. And lastly, you know, focusing on value will drive sales and income because when you're focused on value, you're focused on the things that drive sales and income. So as I write in my book, if you focus on value, you will get uh, a growth in sales and income and you will be able to harvest the wealth that's in your business, but you have to focus on value first and that will then drive all of the other positive outcomes that you're looking for. Now, if you're uh, an advisor uh, that's on the uh, webinar today, uh, I'm going to tee this up for you so that you know how to approach owners and open up a discussion with owners about why this is so important. Um, if you're an owner, uh, I hope that uh, uh, after you go through this webinar and, and learn more about why value should be number one goal, um, that you take it to heart. Because if you do, uh, you will uh, achieve exponential growth in your business and you will be in a position to harvest that wealth when that day comes, preferably on your terms and timeline. And it's going to make you, uh, you know, harvesting the wealth in your business will make you a very wealthy person. Uh, so uh, let's move on to our first subject today. In my experience, I typically see two types of business owners that are in the marketplace. Um, the first type of owner is the lifestyle business owner. Um, the second type of owner is the value creator. 
So about 90% of the businesses that are out there are lifestyle businesses. And I'd even, I know some people in the market that would even argue that that, that is even an aggressive number. But I think it's a reasonable number. 90% are lifestyle businesses, about 10% are value creators. Lifestyle businesses are typically not saleable, um, which explains why we have such poor transition rates. And it's another reason why we see so many strategies fail, because lifestyle businesses rarely achieve their strategies. Both styles generate income for the shareholders, and often it's pretty good income. The difference is that value creators generate above average profits, often well beyond uh, industry metrics. Value creators also have a much stronger growth rates, often again much higher than uh, industry standards. And perhaps most importantly, value creators account for most of the 20% of the businesses that successfully transition, creating substantial wealth for the owners their shareholders, and their families. So what do value creators do that lifestyle business owners don't do? And I've compiled a list of eight things that I tend to see common traits among value creators that I've met during the course of my career. One is they recognize that exiting is part of the business life cycle. Every business has a beginning, a middle, and an end and they know where they are in their life cycle. Um, and they recognize that at some point it will have an end or a transition. Um, and they manage all three aspects of the business life cycle. Um, they focus on value first, which we've talked about previously. Uh, value is something that's always top of mind. When I, I meet them at a ball game or I, I visit them at their offices, we're always talking about value. What's the value of the business? What's the value of this decision? What's the impact of that decision on value? They recognize that 80% of their value lies in intangibles. Um, these are what we call the four C's, uh, which I believe is chapter seven in, in my book. It's human capital, uh, customer capital, structural capital, and social capital. 80% of your value is gonna lie right there. And yet, what we'll explore later on in another webinar, you're probably not getting any feedback in terms of where 80% of your value lies. And that's a big problem that needs to be addressed by you. And you should be getting information, feedback on that number on a regular basis. Um, they also take a systematic approach to identifying, protecting, building, harvesting, and managing value, the five stages. They're systematic about it. Uh, value is integrated in the way they run the business. They chip away what I call relentlessly executing 90 days at a time. They know the strategic direction of the business, but they're good executors. They're disciplined executors, and they get things done. They're able to take big projects, big strategic efforts, and break it down into the activities, the actions that need to take place in order to achieve the uh, the strategy. If your strategy is to exit your business someday, that's a monumental project. It's a multi-year, highly expensive, uh, uh, resource-consuming effort. And the only way you really tackle something that large is you have to chip away at it 90 days at a time. One of the key things that I've really seen among them is that their, their business is uh, owner independent. And if I were to say, uh, you know, if you had to ask me, like, name one, th you know, the number one thing that determines the value of the business, I would say owner independence. It's the first thing that I'll look at to determine, uh, to kind of get a sense for the value of a business. If an owner is independent of their business, that means they probably have strong human capital, strong customer capital, strong structural capital, and strong culture. Um, it allows them to focus on the bigger picture things, as Rob Slee would say, the $5,000 an hour opportunities and problems instead of the $50 an hour opportunities and problems. And uh, because they have that time, uh, they're able to focus on the bigger picture and keep moving the business in the direction it needs to move. They view value growth as an investment 
versus an expense, and they budget for it. So one of the questions I like to ask is, you know, how do you view your advisors? Do you view your advisors as expense items, or do you view your advisors as investment items? Right? It's a big difference in the way you look at it. You've got to, oftentimes, when I start to work with an owner, they have no value growth budget. And so you're not going to accomplish growth uh, if you don't have a budget for it. Typically what I recommend as a starting point is to uh, budget about 1% of the value of your business. The reason is, think about it, if, uh, for, the, for the value of your business, uh, for that, your total net worth outside the business is probably about 20% of your total net worth. And many of you will uh, hire a wealth manager, financial planner, and pay them a point or point and a half to manage that portfolio for you. And yet, you're not willing to spend a point or point and a half to measure where 80% of your value lies. You have to actively invest in it, budget for it, uh, and if it becomes a line item on your budget, you and I both know uh, that's the only way it's going to actually get any real attention. Uh, and lastly, the business is not their only focus. They are balanced. So partly because they're owner independent, um, they have time to invest in themselves. As Stephen Covey would say, you know, the PPC principle. You know, they're not always producing. They spend time improving their productive capacity, so their capacity to produce. So they're balanced, and I met someone recently that said she likes to use the word they're in harmony with their business. Their personal life is in harmony with their business. And you and I both know uh, when you're a business owner, business is personal. And uh, it's easy to, uh, our, for our businesses to consume us. So they're, they're balanced people. Now these, when you look at these things, these are great benefits. And these are the typical characteristics uh, that I'll see um, uh, you know, with, a, with a value creator. Uh, so why focus on value? Well, for one, uh, this is an example of an actual client uh, that I worked with. Uh, uh, as you can see from their portfolio, not including the business, they were worth about $3.7 million. Uh, uh, most of this was tied up in real estate, um, and retirement plans. Uh, they had some in limited partnerships. Uh, a good portion of it was non-income producing. Uh, probably, you know, they were getting some, some income from their real estate, um, uh, which was primarily their business property. Um, and they were obviously getting some income and will likely get future income from their retirement plans. But as you can see uh, uh, from looking at this, uh, uh, they're worth about $3.7 million. Now let's look at the business. Uh, let's look at their net worth with the business included. The business here was a typical uh, middle market business uh, and it was doing around $17 million in sales. Uh, and uh, they, we estimated the value of the business to be around $8.5 million. When you include the value of the business, um, you're looking at a net worth now of about $12.2 million versus $3.7 million. Quite a difference uh, when you look at it. In this case, the business was worth about 70% of the owner's net worth, uh, assuming that they can monetize that. In most cases, financial planners will tell you uh, uh, that about, you know, what they see is that typically about 80% of the owner's net worth is tied up in their business. I can comfortably say that in my experience that the business is worth 60 to 70%, uh, almost at least 60% and almost always higher than that. And so the point here is that obviously the value of the business is a significant uh, contributor to your net worth. Uh, before I move on to that, I have one other thing. I was just looking at my notes here. Uh, this business, as I said, was doing around $17 million in sales. Um, they were doing around $1.4 million uh, in uh, recasted EBITDA. 
uh, which was about 8.2% uh, to sales. So uh, pretty good, you know, I mean, they're generating 1.4 million a year out of this business. Uh, pretty good income coming in when you think about it. Uh, I take it, uh, they were pretty happy, they were living pretty well, their children went to private schools, they had a second home, uh, the owner was a, 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 a boater, uh, also liked to ride his motorcycle, they were living a pretty good life, right? But they depended on the income of the business to support their lifestyle. And uh, if unable to convert the business asset, uh, their income would drop to around $222,000, which is about a $1.2 million pay cut. Um, they would still um, take a pay cut even if they were able to cash in on the business. I mean, that's just the reality, right? Uh, even if we were able to sell the business for $8.5 million, their ongoing stream at $12.2 million would be about $732,000 a year versus the 222 if they don't, uh, if they aren't able to harvest the business. And that's a difference of about 230%. Um, it's still a pay cut, you know, going to 732 versus 1.4 is still a pay cut, but certainly uh, that would be much easier to absorb going forward than a pay cut from 1.4 million to $200,000. Now, there are millions of businesses that are in this situation. Uh, I've discussed in previous webinars that there are roughly 6 million privately held businesses in the U.S. market. 4 million of them are baby boomers who, whether they like it or not, are facing the inevitable exit of their business. And I would estimate out of those 4 million businesses, only about 400,000 of them are uh, value creators. So if you own a lifestyle business, you may still be happy with your income and happy with your business performance as these owners were. But it's unlikely you'll ever harvest the wealth that resides in the business. You simply won't be able to sell it. And if you're thinking of transitioning to a family or employees or management, the odds are heavily against you that that transition will be successful. And, and that's important because inside transitions, uh, you typically don't get a big liquidity event when you do an inside transition. Inside options, uh, you'll likely need to finance it, and that means that the business will need to continue to operate uh, and work even better after you leave uh, in order for you to get all your money out. And you're looking at a, a transition period of, of, of likely five to 10 years. So if you haven't prepared the business or your successor properly, you'll likely not see uh, the cash flow as promised at close, and you won't be able to extract all your wealth. Sometimes you even may have to go back into the business. So even if you're looking at an inside option, you still need to be a value creator is my point. Uh, I've had owners I've gone out to meet with and they've said, well, Chris, I don't need to do this stuff because I'm just transitioning it to my son. And I've said, said to the owner, are you going to transition all your problems? You're going to transition all your risk to your son? You don't want to do that, right? And the thing is, is you need to make sure your son can run this business as good or better as when you were there in order to get all your money out because you're going to have to finance the transaction. So to achieve your goals and convert the wealth that you so richly deserve uh, in your business, regardless of which option you choose, you have to be uh, a value creator. So my first question really to you to think about is what style of business owner are you? Are you uh, in the 90% lifestyle business owners or are you in the 10% of uh, the business owners that are value creators? Now let's look at um, another one of my uh, uh, past uh, owners that I've worked with um, and uh, let's take a look at you know their particular scenario here. Uh, this was a company we'll call it CWR, 
their sales were uh, had grown pretty nicely over a three-year period. About a 15% compound annual growth rate had grown from 21.8 million to 33.4 million over three years. Their EBITDA had grown from 1.2 million to about 2.5 million, which was about a 27% uh, compound annual growth rate. Their recasted EBITDA as a percent to sales was roughly about seven and a half percent. So it's still generating a pretty nice income, uh, but the industry average was at around 10.5%. So uh, they weren't performing to industry uh, standards, uh, but they were still generating some pretty good income. And it wasn't surprising their margins were a little bit lower because they were the, part of their competitive edge was uh, they were a you know, low-cost kind of provider. The median industry multiple in this particular market was around 4.6, was 4.57, and the best in class multiple was about 6, 7.65. So you can see, you know, more than three points higher uh, were the best in class uh, companies. Now the question is, when you just look at these stats, uh, you know, does this business have any value? You certainly would think it would have some value, wouldn't you? I mean, given the amount of sales and, and the profits that it's generating, it's not performing the industry standards, but it's still performing pretty well. So let's take a look at how we evaluate uh, that decision. There are two things um, that you really need to take a look at. One is uh, you need to come up with a couple of different scores. You need to come up with what we call an attractiveness score and a readiness score. And I'll explain the difference between the two of them. And what I've been saying all along, too, as we've been going through these webinars, is all of this stuff that we talk about, this is all can be metric-based. It can all be measured. So you don't have to guess. You can actually go out and measure this stuff, and then you know. It's not you think, you know. And so uh, we went out for this particular owner and uh, did an assessment a personal financial business assessment uh, for his business. So let's take a look at what we found. When we looked at attractiveness of the business, um, we were looking at some pretty good things. They had uh, pretty good customer tenure. They had uh, fairly good staff longevity. Um, clearly, they had some growth going on in sales and profits, 15% compound annual growth rate in sales is pretty good and uh, you'll double the business every five years, you do that. 27% compound annual growth rate and income look pretty good too. Uh, competitive positioning, they were pretty solid as a low cost provider. Uh, the business, business was pretty low risk and uh, they had a good financial uh, person in the business, good set of financial documentation. So from an attractiveness standpoint, uh, they looked you know, pretty attractive. Well, let's look at some of the business attractiveness weaknesses. Um, the two that pop out in particular uh, was the business was very owner dependent, uh, very much relied on the owner. Uh, there were two owners of this business, two partners. One of the owners really ran sales, the other one ran finance. Um, and they had the, what I call clustered customer concentration. So uh, it was a small group of customers uh, made up a majority of their sales. Now they uh, had good tenure with those customers, but they were a small group and the relationship was directly with the owner who had been in the industry previously and had left the industry uh, to uh, uh, per, you know, start his own business or actually purchase this business. And uh, uh, he brought those relationships with him. Uh, he still managed all those relationships directly with the customers. Uh, those relationships were pretty deep. Um, and uh, 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 as a result, those people were being you know, pretty loyal to him. You know, one of the things that can happen, though, is you've got a loyal uh, uh, member at a Fortune 500 company, and then all of a sudden that person gets let go or moves on somewhere else, and somebody new rolls in. You ever see that before? And all of a sudden you were relying on those loyal that loyalty from your uh, past relationships and that, that and now you're starting all over again. There were a few other things that were weak in this business, uh, low barriers to entry, not, you know, none of their business systems and processes were documented. 
Uh, they didn't have any packaged IP or, or tech, technology packaged up. Very uh, limited, if any, brand awareness. Um, low recurring revenue, so they were the type of business where they had to rebid each year. Um, the market was sort of flat. Uh, they were in a non-dominating position. They were a small player in a big market. Uh, they found a little bit of a niche, um, and they were exploiting that niche. And you know, from a synergistic standpoint, a strategic buyer that would look at them would not see a lot of synergies in buying this business. Now, as I mentioned, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look at attractiveness. So attractiveness is looking at the business from the outside in. Right? It's what a, a buyer would look at or what whomever the new owner would be, the way your son or daughter would look at the business or the way your employees would look at the business. It's looking at the business outside in. So a business can look very attractive from the outside in, but it may not be, it may not be ready to transition or ready to grow. So you have to measure both attractiveness and readiness. And readiness is really all around proof it's really a lot to do with structural capital. Um, it's, it's documenting the way you do things so that it becomes company property. And when you make a company property, it can easily be, you know, not necessarily easily, but it can certainly be transferred to someone else who will pay you, especially if it's good, a premium for it. So from an attractiveness standpoint, we looked at the business. Let's look at the business from a readiness standpoint. When we looked at the business from a readiness standpoint. Uh, they were below goal in 20 of the 21 categories where we look at readiness. Remember, I'll remind you again, readiness is not just readiness to sell, it's also readiness to grow. Um, they had no written transition strategy, no strategic plan, no testimonials, awards, or community recognition, no customer analytics to share. Uh, marketing had not been systematized. because They really weren't doing a lot of marketing because they were relying on these relationships the owner had. No HR strategy, no development program for uh, the next group of management that would come up. That's going to create a problem when, when they try to scale. Um, employee documentation was weak. No contracts, customer or supplier contracts. All of this was being done on a handshake. Uh, business systems were not documented. No expense analytics, no financial forecast or support for their history. They did have obviously a strong history, but they didn't have any support for it, showing me like, what assumptions did you make and what caused, what, what were the things that you did to grow the business? And they had no historical dashboard, so they could lead, they could describe their story to somebody who might be looking at the business. And remember, when we look at readiness, and we discussed this last month, personal, right? It's three-legged stool, so personal and financial need to be addressed as well. So we not only need to look at business readiness, we need to look at you as the owner. Personally, are you ready? These owners had no written personal strategy. They had not done a needs or wants analysis, no contingency planning, no personal financial plan, and no estate plan. It was a disaster from a readiness standpoint. So my question to the owner was, what would a buyer be buying? So when I did the analysis and I presented back the results, you know, the owner said to me sort of, you know, excitingly like, hey, what do you think? What's the value of the business? And I said, I, I hate to tell you, but I, I think it has little to no value at all. And he's like, how can that be? I've had these growth, growth rates. I've had great income. How can that possibly be? And then I showed him his readiness scores. And uh, understanding the difference between attractiveness and readiness, yeah, it looked reasonably attractive. You're certainly not ready, um, and you'd never pass a due diligence uh, process uh, with uh, uh, private equity or with anyone that would be looking at the business. Um, typically what happens when you take an attractive business to market that, that isn't ready, uh, it never makes it through due diligence, or you start getting offers uh, that are completely different than what you were offered at close. And most of those will require you to uh, uh, take on risk, and most of those offers will become contingent. So I basically asked the owner, what would the buyer be buying? Right? They maybe want to buy your customer list, uh, but they're not going to give you a premium for that. Uh, they might give you pennies on the dollar for that, um, but 
they're not going to really give you anywhere near around average or above average when it comes to value. Okay. So should CWR focus on value? Would focusing on value drive more sales and income? Absolutely. Um, what would the owner do with their newfound time? Well, first of all, if they focus on value, um, one of the things they need to do is they need, they're going to get better sales performance from the sales staff. One of the things the owner told me is he controls most of the sales coming in. There was maybe one other person in the business that could sell like he did, and the rest of them were average at best, yet he had no program to train them how to become good salespeople. A uh, broader brand not relying on the owner's relationships. I really said to them, I think you do have a brand. It's just you haven't taken the time to actually package it up because you're clearly growing and the people are buying stuff from you and uh, they're clearly seeing value in that. If you could package up, you know, the uh, brand promise, the, the value add that you're providing for this small group of customers, I think that's something that we could really take to market and we could in a more broad sense go after the market and uh, sell the company and sell the brand rather than sell you. Uh, ability to further scale while keeping margins and expenses under control. I mean, my feeling was they clearly showed growth, but what I've seen in these situations when a business starts to scale and it isn't ready to scale, you're going to hit a ceiling, you hit a wall, because there's only so much capacity that the owner can take on. And so it was very likely that this business would hit a wall down the road and the growth would actually start to decline, expenses would start to grow at a faster rate than sales, and uh, might even we might even see you know not only sales flat flat uh, flatten out, but we might actually see a decline. A uh, time to recruit new people, evolve people, and grow new accounts, uh, expand the markets, products, and lines of business, build the brand. Uh, these are the kinds of things that the owner should be doing in this particular situation. Now, what would it be worth? Well, if you looked at their EBITDA and you looked at the, the average multiple in the market, doing this is worth around $11.5 million. Um, and that's at the average level in the market versus you know, maybe getting 20% of that if they don't do these things. So it's really, you know, the point here is that it's really worth going after that eleven and a half million dollars and if that becomes the goal putting the business focusing on value and targeting eleven and a half million dollar value and then going in reverse and saying what do we have to do to uh, achieve that kind of evaluation and what you're typically going to find is that number will continue to drive because you'll be doing all of the things that you need to be doing these kinds of things here and the readiness, developing written strategies, uh, developing a strategic plan, building your brand, building up your staff so that you can scale the business, um, you know, managing growth and managing the expenses and the margins as you grow, and you get the idea. Um, but it's certainly worth you know a lot of money. Now, one of the things that I wanted to point out is there's a couple of companies. Uh, private equity companies that I know pretty well. One of them is located here in Cleveland, Ohio. It's called Riverside. Some of you might be familiar with them already. They're, they're one of the largest private equity companies in the market today. Um, to give you an idea how difficult it is to sell to one of these uh, particular buyers, Riverside told me they looked at, they were presented 4,000 businesses last year. They took a hard look at 400 and they closed 40. That's 1% of the businesses that were presented to them. So, you know, what ha happened <laughs> to the other uh, 3,960 businesses that they passed on, right? I wonder. Um, another company called Jordan Industries out of Chicago, another company I know pretty well, good people there, uh, they, looked, they told me they looked at 1,000 deals last year and they closed 30 which is about 3%. So my point is, uh, if you're thinking of transitioning uh, down the road and you haven't 
uh, gotten your business ready or yourself ready, as well as made it attractive, uh, you're going to have a tough road to, uh, you might get lucky, but uh, we don't want you to be lucky. We want you to be prepared. Uh, and the odds are that you're not going to be able to harvest the wealth in your business. And it's going to be, and it's worth a lot of money. So what these uh, private equity companies are looking for is they're looking for businesses that are not only attractive, but also ready. Um, okay. Now let's look at what the difference is between attractiveness and readiness, right? We already talked about attractiveness is outside in. Readiness is really inside out. So it's are you ready and uh, is the business ready? And when we talk ready, we're not just talking about exit ready because, again, I'll point out again, what will happen is if you try to grow a business that isn't ready to scale, you're going to hit a wall. You're going to hit a ceiling at some point. Now. Readiness is not the decision to sell or grow. It's not the decision. It's a state of fact, not state of mind. So let me repeat that. Readiness is a state of fact, not state of mind. What do I mean by that? State of fact means that it's factual. It has to be proven. That's what readiness is. It has to be proven. It can't be what you think. It has to be what you know. Somebody's going to come in, they're going to say, I want to see your written strategies. I want to see your dashboards from the last three years. I want to look at all your financial records. I want to look at all your employee records. I want to see how you're developing your management team. I want to know how you do your marketing. They're going to want to know all these things, and they're going to want to see it written down. They're going to want evidence of it. So you have to prepare these facts. This is all done in structural capital, right? There's two considerations. Are you ready, and is the business ready? And we call this, uh, we call this in the eyes of the current owner, the ugly baby. We all look at our businesses, we all think they're more valuable than they really are in most cases, in many cases. And the fact is, even if our businesses are a little bit ugly, it's still our baby, right? And we call that the ugly baby. So my baby might be, uh, 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 my, my business might be ugly, but it's still my ugly baby. And from, from a buyer standpoint, they're not looking, they have no emotional attachment to your business at all. They're simply, simply looking at it as, should I be paying a premium or a discount or getting a discount on this particular business? So understand that when someone else uh, comes in to look at your business from the outside in, they're going to come in with a different perspective uh, than what you have. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples as we start to wind down here. This is an example of an attractiveness score. Uh, you know, it shows a particular business where we went in and we scored the business. And you can see in this case, uh, the goal would be to score at 67% or better. Uh, um, in this particular case, these were three partners that we uh, all took through separately, evaluated their opinion. You can see in their opinion, they all came pretty close in terms of where they felt what their attractiveness was. So it looks like a pretty attractive business. Then we looked at readiness, and you can see their scores down there at the bottom. How ready are you to sell down here? 51, 53, 50, uh, 53. That puts them almost in the uh, uh, discount or being unable to sell uh, uh, category. Anything at about 50% or below is what we call the red zone. It means it's extremely weak. Um, a buyer will discount it at minimum, and it may actually prevent you from uh, being able to sell the business. It's also an indication that if you're doing an inside option, that your that your transition is likely not going to be successful because there's too much risk in the business. You're passing all these these problem areas over to the next generation, whether that be employees, children, or your management team, and they're going to want a discount for on the business at at best. But odds are that transition isn't going to be successful. And this is why only 30% of the family businesses make it through the second generation. The math is pretty simple. Um, uh, it's cash times your multiple equals value, right? And the real key here to accelerated value growth is to focus on the multiple. And, uh, and, and really, uh, that multiple is based on the scores in attractiveness and readiness. So we can get your cash and sales, but then we want to score the business from a readiness and attractiveness standpoint to determine where you fall uh, in terms of the range of multiples. 
let's look at this uh, uh, formula for a bit here. I know this is a, a bit much on this slide, but let's let's look at the left side of the equation first. It's recasted, normalized, adjusted, all mean the same. When we talk in cash, we're talking about recasted EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Recasted EBITDA is the market's measure of earnings being generated from ongoing normalized operations. Key here is it needs to be normalized. Um, and what is normalization? You know, what's the process of normalizing the numbers? Look over here to the right. Normaliz normalize, you'll typically need to normalize salaries, rent, bonuses. Um, these are things where maybe you're paying yourself a market salary that's above the market. So that needs to be normalized down in order to get, remember, we're looking for a normalized uh, ongoing stream of income from the business. Rent, sometimes we charge ourselves a little bit higher rent than the market, that would need to be adjusted to market. Bonuses, sometimes we have uh, discretionary bonuses that we pay out in one particular year, those would need to be adjusted down as well. Discretionary expenses, things like second homes, cars, boats, travel, bonuses, uh, employees uh, uh, that aren't really working full time, let's say, uh, insurances, uh, health care, different discretionary things that you may be running through the business that wouldn't be considered normal uh, uh, part of uh, a re normal requirement uh, of the business. And then one-time charges like asset write-offs, sales write-offs, capital, legal, uh, accounting, consulting fees, for example, that might you might have had a heavy consulting assignment in one particular year that's not going to be uh, a continuous expense of the business. You would write off some of those. Sometimes you're not going to write off all of it. Sometimes you just write off a portion of the expense because you had an extraordinary year. And your balance sheet down to the left might include inventory write-offs, accounts receivable write-offs, asset write-offs, debt payoffs, lots of things. This is what I call the real number. There's two numbers in every business, the tax number, which you see on your financial statements, and then the real number. And the real number is the number that's used to drive value, uh, to, to calculate value in the business. So you need to know what your recasted EBITDA is. And my guess is that many of you don't get that information on a regular basis unless you've done a recent valuation. Let's look at the right side. All businesses, what you need to understand is all businesses trade in a range of value, right? The range of value multiple is determined by the private capital market. You can't control that. So the private capital market will look at an industry and within that industry, you'll find some businesses that trade at four and some businesses trading at eight, right? Why do some businesses trade at eight versus four? Well, the businesses at eight have stronger intangible assets. They're premier businesses. You go back to our readiness score, they're gonna have higher scores. They're gonna be ready and attractive. And as a result, they're gonna get a higher multiple. Um, move the score up then, we move the business higher in the range. And that can all be measured as each one of those value factors that I showed you with CWR. Uh, all of those factors drive where you land in the range of value. So as the owner improves those factors, that would mean that they would score higher. And because they're scoring higher, that would move them up into the range of value. So they may be sitting at four and they have a chance to move to five, six, seven, or eight. The beauty of that is that can all be measured. That can be tracked, it can be measured, and then if it can be uh, if we can track it and measure it, we can manage it. I use a system called common sense scoring that scores all of those factors on a scale of one to six. Five or six meaning you're in the premier category, uh, up at best in class. One or two means uh, it's completely missing or it's extremely weak. Three, four means you're somewhere around average. I don't score one to five because I don't want average. I would rather you force you to make a decision as to whether you think you're slightly above average or slightly below average. And the beauty of that is it makes you think about it a little bit more and justify why you might move up or move down in a particular range. What you're after are two scores, attractiveness and ready. When both the right side and the left side are improved, you get an exponential increase in value. And that's really how you accelerate value. Now, what are the benefits? Um, it establishes based on fact your present value. So if you haven't done, one of the factors that we look for in our state of owner readiness surveys is how recent is your most recent 
business valuation. In many cases, owners have never had a valuation formally done. Um, I recommend you do it at least every other year. Uh, for my uh, businesses personally and for owners that I work with, we do it every year. Uh, the first time through takes a little bit of effort, but once we have the numbers recasted and we have a sense for where the market is, uh, to keep that number up doesn't take much effort uh, to maintain that number. What we'll do is we'll determine the present value, and then as we make improvements on the value factors, we'll go back in, rescore the business, calculate a new attractiveness and readiness score, and then associate that to a new a multiple and then we can calculate the value gain that we've had from the previous year. Second benefit, it predicts the probability of succeeding with growth and transition strategies. If you score poorly, you're not likely going to be successful with either one of those strategies. Third, it identifies what we call your profit gap. So in this particular case, CWR, we knew that CWR was doing about 7.5% to sales. We saw that the average in the industry was around 10.5%. The best in class were up around 13, 13.1, 13 I think, was the number we came up with, 13% plus. By knowing that, we can calculate what we call the profit gap. We take the best in class number times your sales level versus your uh, uh, EBITDA as a percent to sales times your sales, and that's going to give us a, a gap. And that gap is what we call the profit gap, and that's how much money, how much cash, uh, you're potentially leaving on the table every year by not operating at a premium level. Uh, the fourth item is it identifies what we call the value gap. Once we know what the potential uh, uh, value uh, EBITDA is of the business and what the high-end multiples are, we can calculate that to determine what the high-end businesses are trading at at your sales level. And that's going to, you know, that's going to be a combination of increased cash plus increased multiple. And you're going to see, oftentimes, this number can be 200% or more of what your current present value is. We can calculate that. What that does is that tells us what our potential value is, and it tells us what value enhancement is worth. And last, it's going to identify the actions you can take to protect, build, and harvest value. So when we, we know what our weak areas are, we can build a plan around that. And we can begin to implement in 90-day sprints actions which improve those factors, which is then going to raise our score. Uh, within our exit planning circles at EPI, uh, with the Certified Exit Planning Advisors, we call this the triggering event, is what we call this process. And uh, the triggering event is an independent personal, financial, and business assessment correlated to business range of value. And it has all the benefits that I just talked about uh, when you do this. Now, why do I call it the triggering event? I call it a triggering event because what I've seen is that uh, for owners that go through this process, 70% of the time they go forward with action because the information is so revealing to them um, and they can quantify what value enhancement would be worth and they can formally measure how ready they are to transition or grow, uh, it compels them to take action going forward. And what actions do we take? Uh, we go back to our readiness and attractiveness. We look at those weak areas, and we start to build a plan around, doing, around making improvements. And that's what we're going to cover in future webinars. Um, we'll cover, once we know what our uh, strengths and weaknesses are, we can now build a plan. And, uh, and we'll look at how we do that in upcoming webinars in creating action plans and relentlessly executing so that not only can we identify where our opportunities are, but we can actually harvest those opportunities. We can implement them and watch our value grow. Our next webinar is going to be on May 10th from 1 to 2 Eastern time, and we're going to focus on how we build a plan. We're going to focus on uh, uh, pre a present focus. And this is why I say exit planning is present. It's not something we do down the road. It's what we do every day affects our opportunities for exit. Um, and so we need a present focus on it and forget, I want you to just forget about the end game and just if you just focus on now and making improvements now, 
um, you will have lots of opportunities to harvest and you will see exponential growth in your business. So your homework, uh, uh, your action item for this particular uh, webinar is to consider completing a triggering event in the next 90 days. Uh, if you have read my book, Walking to Destiny, the last chapter, I give you six steps to take. I'm often asked by the media when I do interviews, well, what's the first step an owner should take? And, and I always say, they've got to get a triggering event done because it's so revealing and quantifiable that it sets the baseline for all of the value acceleration actions we're going to be taking going forward. So I want you to seriously think hard about that. Uh, if I can help you uh, make that decision or I can clarify anything I covered today, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you would like me to put you in touch with a local SEPA in your particular area, I'd be happy to do that as well. Just uh, reach out and um, I'm perfectly glad to help. And if, uh, if I don't hear from you, I hopefully will uh, be able to talk to you again uh, next month. Thank you. Over to you, Drew. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Uh, definitely appreciate you spending your time with us today. Uh, and like Chris said, guys, um, more than welcome to reach out to him or myself. Um, we're both resources here for you. would be more than happy to help. Uh, but like I said before as well, um, I will be sending the recording out um, of this webinar uh, in a little bit once it downloads. And so just look out for an email from me with that recording for your reviews. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us uh, an email or a call. Uh, but with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Hope everyone has a good rest of the day and a great rest of the week, and we will see you guys next month.